All right, looks like we've somewhat stabilized. Uh, we're about 73 attendees right now. So I wanna welcome everyone tonight uh, to the Aviation Town Hall. You know, Normally we do a, a talk to the entire college, but there were enough aviation specific questions that we wanted to talk to the aviation students and their parents. You know, I haven't seen the list of all who's here. So, so welcome to everyone. Uh, it is being recorded. And so this will be available to everyone and your friends and everyone else who wants to see it after this. Uh, I want to start off by just saying it is still a great time to be in the aviation profession. Uh, it's been a great time the nine months that I've been here or 10 months now uh, and to see the airline industry recover after COVID, you know, everyone expected it was going to be a long recovery. And what we've seen, if anyone's traveled uh, on airlines this year, it's been amazing how fast it, it's recovered. Not only that, I get to sign the restricted ATP certificates as people are getting hired by the airlines. And as of today, I have now signed 92 certificates since I got here. Uh, that's a lot. And so we're continuing to see those, which means we'll be hiring more CFIs as they become available. And uh, Jeremy's gonna talk about that later in the, in the talk. We're also establishing several new partnerships to expand the opportunities you have to choose from. Uh, we'll share some of those later in this meeting too. Speaking of COVID, I wanna say thank you to everyone uh, for doing their part in getting vaccinated and continuing to follow the mask policy. Your efforts have helped keep the spread of the virus to very small numbers across our program. I mean, it's been amazing over the past year and a half or two years just to see how little spread of the virus there's been within our community, thanks to the work of everybody. You've seen the news releases about how much flying's taken place over the past year. We had 126,000 hours over the last academic year and 15,974 hours alone in September. As much as we celebrate those numbers, uh, the question we ask is, are those hours incident free? The answer is no. And so in the year 2020, so last year, we had 20 incidents reportable of one kind or another. Fortunately, none of them were major accidents uh, that caused damage or serious injury to anyone, but they were all minor incidents of one report or another. So far this year, we've had 22. So despite the fact that we're flying a lot, we do still need to be vigilant uh, about everything that we're doing. So this highlights the fact that we should never rest on our laurels. In his 1997 book, Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents, uh, Dr. James Reason suggested that safety culture consists of five elements. In an informed culture, the organization collects and analyzes relevant data and actively disseminates information. This is why we have regular safety videos, messages, and this is our safety week. Hopefully you've seen at least two of the videos this week, and if not all three. I'd like to say thank you to Brian Willis and the entire team that put these together. Yesterday, we had a great discussion hearing from a person who got past an alcohol incident when they were a university student. And then today's discussion was with an aviation medical examiner. A reporting culture means cultivating an atmosphere where people have confidence to report safety concerns without fear or blame. Everyone must know that confidentiality will be maintained and that the information they submit will be acted upon, otherwise they will decide there's no benefit in reporting. This also means we should not speculate about situations or share specifics on social media. Let the investigation take place. If this has never happened to you, try to put yourself in the shoes of someone it has. Would you want other people jumping to conclusions and judging based on erroneous or missing information? Please respect the process. A learning culture means that an organization is able to learn from its mistakes and make changes. Hopefully we have few. In the business world, this is also known as continuous process improvement. In a just culture, errors and unsafe acts will not be punished if the error was unintentional. However, those who act recklessly or take deliberate and unjustifiable risks will still be subject to disciplinary action. There is a big difference between a mistake that can be forgiven and a crime. A flexible culture is one where the organization and the people in it are capable of adapting effectively to changing demands. With respect to COVID, our university leadership is monitoring the situation and local case numbers to determine when we can lift further restrictions. We're not there yet, and we ask that you bear with us as we continue wearing masks, washing hands, keeping distance, all those types of things. All of us want to get to that point where we can return to some sense of normal as much as we can. Next thing I want to talk about is our course registration process, and that's what's generated the majority of the questions we've gotten this year. Many of the policies we have in place are based on lessons learned over the history of this program. We've seen what works and what doesn't. 
the inf most of this information or actually all of this information is available on our aviation web page of our college website. Additionally, we've expanded the frequently asked questions list to clear up some of the questions we've received since the beginning of the semester. Some of the questions we've received are, why do we use this process? Why do we have to be finished with previous flight training to move to the next ground school? Why is there a Friday noon deadline for course completion prior to the first week of class? Let me start with the process. For those who aren't familiar, so our freshmen and other people who haven't been, been in any of these situations, there are two different systems that are used to keep track of and manage our operations. There's Campus Connection and there's AIMS. Campus Connection is the university's course registration system, but it has no idea of a student's flight training progress. This is tracked in AIMS. AIMS is our aviation management software and has everything from student flight records to aircraft maintenance status. AIMS is what we use on a daily basis to track everything. This process ensures that students making adequate progress in flight training are given an opportunity to plan their schedule for the next semester by reserving a seat in AIMS while allowing them to finish their flight training. Let me repeat, reserving a seat in AIMS is not the same as registering for the course. It's only a placeholder if training is on track and the student is likely to finish on time. Each course must still be completed before progressing to the next. When you see that there are seats available in AIMS, that's not an accurate reflection of what's in Campus Connection or of even who's eligible. The aviation department leadership looks at each course and the number of seats and works with the airport staff to make sure there are enough instructors when determining how many total slots are in a class. If we have flight capacity, we'll continue to add seats. And if we need to hire an additional faculty member, we will. Students are authorized to register in Campus Connection only when the prerequis prerequisite flight training is complete. This ensures that all students officially registered for each course are eligible to be enrolled in that course. In the past, any student was able to register for the next course in Campus Connection, regardless of flight progress. This filled up classes quickly and took away the opportunity for students who are making adequate progress to plan their schedules. Effectively, we would overfill classes in the first week or two of class, we would have to remove people from class, and then we would have to add people in, and the people that were added in got added in, missing those first couple lessons of class, and it caused a huge confusion on both sides. As, as likely the people that are removed from class now have a hole in their schedule. And so we instituted the, the uh, previous training and the Friday deadline to, to counter that. So why do we need to be complete with all previous training? We've learned from experience that the quality of training declines when there's a separation between the ground school, the new ground school that they want to take and the flight training if it's not in sync with the class that they're taking. Learning is an active process. Students should be applying knowledge from the ground school in the airplane. This reduces the likelihood of unsatisfactory outcomes on stage checks and ground school exams. A delay in beginning flight training with ground school increases the likelihood a student will not complete that training during that semester, and a strong start is critical to success. We also look at flying in August and September compared to later in the semester. The later you start to fly, the less chance there is of finishing the class that semester. Students cannot graduate until all flight training is complete. This avoids piling up all of the ground schools and leaving flight training to the point where a student would no longer be an active UND student, and this has, but still has flight training to finish. And if you lose your student status, that means you also lose financial aid that goes with it. Each flight course has two final exams, the test in class and the stage check in the airplane. An element of the course grade depends on the stage check performance. An unsatisfactory outcome could result in, an un, in a failing grade in that previous course. We must ensure the student has passed the previous course before moving to the next ground school. Finally, the financial aid budget is based on the enrolled ground school for that particular semester. For example, a student that's enrolled in multi-engine ground school, 325, would receive all of the budget for 325. So if they started 325 and had not finished the previous class, the money would be in their account which means it could be spent on that previous course and they could spend it leaving no money left for 325 when they go to start flying that. Now, let me talk about the Friday noon deadline. Looking at AIMS and allowing registration and campus connection is a manual process. It requires time to look at each person's record individually and to allow the registration process prior to the first day of class. 
But this means once registered, students can start on day one, on that Monday or whatever the first day of class is and not have to wait to be added to the course as a new seat becomes available. It also ensures all students are assigned to flight instructors before the first day of class. It allows students who won't meet prerequisites an opportunity to find a replacement class before the semester begins. It also prevents students from being removed from a class after it starts. And finally, it allows flight ops to focus on a strong start with the students beginning a new course rather than being occupied with finish up training. Now, I do wanna mention briefly, there are some circumstances when we can do a class mid semester, depending on which course it is and when it is. And when that is an option, those people who are eligible for that class will be contacted by one of the aviation leadership uh, and be told when they can register for that class. And so if you're in that situation, we're aware of who you are and you will be contacted. So that's enough of my comments. And so I, we've got four other people that are gonna add to the conversation tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to our aviation department chair next. So off to you, Brett. Thank you, Dean Kraus. Welcome everybody. Thanks for attending tonight. I'm Brett Van Heisen. I'm the chair and a professor in the aviation department. And I'm going to share some general updates with you. Um, and then we'll move on to some other speakers. So Beth, if you could advance the slides. If you're here on campus, you are aware that we are having a very, very busy semester. Um, and here's a chart that shows why that is. We have a lot of students here. Um, our biggest number of students are commercial aviation majors. And if you look at that number, you can see that in fall of 2021, we have 1,762 commercial aviation majors. So those are significant increases year over year from back in fall of 2017. All of these majors have, have increased. Um, we've also seen significant increases in our graduate programs as well. So our faculty are busy, our students are busy, our airport is busy, and we are, are really, um, really busting at the seams here in the aviation department. So what are we doing to address this increased demand? Next slide, there we go. Um, we have uh, started this fall with two new online degrees. There's no flying involved with either of these degrees, aviation safety and operations and aviation studies. Those are great alternatives for folks that um, maybe have flying from a, a previous uh, life, a previous effort, or maybe are not interested in flying or looking for an alternative degree. So those new degrees are available. We also are working hard at managing our enrollment limits and we are making efforts to reduce the number of students that we admit to our program. So starting next fall, for the academic year starting in fall 2022, we are aiming to enroll 325 students total for the year. Um, and, and those students are all going to have to have a 3.0 or higher high school GPA. So by increasing the quality of students and decreasing the number of students, um, hopefully things will run more smoothly and be a little bit more manageable for us. We're gonna adjust this on a yearly basis to come up with a uh, overall number of students where we can successfully manage that group. We also need faculty members to teach all of these students. And so for fall 2022, I'm putting in a request for five new faculty positions. Um, one will teach uh, in our air traffic area, one in UAS, and then three faculty that will deal with uh, flight courses and safety and, and other topical areas if we can find faculty to, to fill those positions. So that is in, in process as we, as we speak. We have hired several new faculty members that started in fall of 2021 that are really helping with this demand and, and working out really well. We have uh, Samantha Ross, she's an assistant professor primarily teaching Aviation 102. She's a graduate of our program from a number of years ago and then went on to get a, a master's degree and is bringing her experience back now uh, to us here at uh, the Aviation Department. Tanner Yackley joins us from the UAS industry. Tanner is an assistant professor. He has his master's degree as well from Ambry Riddle. He is teaching a variety of UAS courses for us. And so that's his focus area. And then we have a new uh, position in the department. We have a lot of research that we're involved with beyond um, you know, our normal activities with students. And so we've hired our first assistant research professor. Srijith Nair is um, working on a number of UAS related research projects and we welcome him to our faculty as well. 
We do have a large focus on safety, as Dean Krauss mentioned. That is, that is number one. Everything we do, we want to make sure we do it in as safe a manner as we can. And our faculty continue to be leaders in the field of aviation safety. Um, they have numerous active research projects involving areas of aviation safety. There are is a safety analysis class that uh, many of our students take, and students that are enrolled in that class get to work with the premier EMS software, which is used by major airlines to manage FOCWA data, and they get to study how FOCWA data is used and become familiar with that. Our interest in data and analyzing data and managing data and making safety decisions based on data stems from a tragic accident that happened back in October of 2007. Annette Klosterman was the flight instructor on board the aircraft that was involved in that accident. And it was one of our Seminole, our Piper Seminole aircraft that was on a cross country flight from the Minneapolis area back to Grand Forks at night. And the aircraft hit geese and tragically control was lost and, and Annette and her student passed away. Um, Annette's family have remained great supporters of our program and friends of our program and are very involved uh, with our aviation program. They've graciously allowed us to name our new aviation safety lab in her honor. Students will be able to use this new space to continue learning about aviation safety and promoting aviation safety. And we do have a picture of the space on the next slide. It's in um, a main room in Odegaard Hall on the first floor. Um, you've got a, a nice area with the computers for students to work using this uh, software. And then there's a conference room, which you can't see from the photo where discussions can continue on aviation safety matters. So really uh, like to thank the classrooms for their support um, in our efforts to increase aviation safety. I have some updates on our air traffic management program. We are engaged in the UFA radar lab upgrade that is scheduled to start in November, but we're concerned that there may be some delays. As all of you know, we are experiencing delays like any uh, business would with getting hardware delivered to us. And um, we're hoping that that can still go on as scheduled, but it's possible that it might get delayed towards the semester break, but we are, are planning to do those updates. We also have some upgrades scheduled with our Adacel Tower Simulator, the 225 degree simulator and the 360 degree simulator. Those updates are scheduled to start in May of 2022. And our air traffic faculty are also actively looking into offering some Aviation 103 sections in the evening. So more to follow on that if that becomes available. We have a number of UAS updates. Um, UAS operations has a Blackboard site now. If you haven't been receiving periodic emails from Paul Snyder, send him an email. His email is on the slide there, paul.snyder at und.edu. Tell him you'd like to be added to the UAS operations site list and he will get you added to that so that you get those updates. Um, he posts job openings there. He posts uh, UAS student resources there, announcements for various opportunities to engage in the UAS industry. And he's recently uh, done a webinar and recorded that. And that webinar discusses the changes to the airplane flight curriculum and its impacts on our UAS students. There's an event coming up October 14th from noon to two. It's an event for UAS students to engage with UAS employers. Um, and here's a link to that event. Please sure and register for that on the UND calendar if you're interested in participating. And then some course specific updates when it comes to UAS. Um, AVIT 450, the counter UAS course, will be offered in spring of 2022. So plan on that for your enrollment. We're also going to be offering AVIT 419. We need to get enrollment numbers up for this course. It's a, a great semester to get this course done. So if that's needed in your program of study, please keep that in mind and register for that course when you can. Um, our UAS program has also recently signed a CRADA with the DHS and the CBP to work together on various training, research, and education products. And so um, there's kind of a uh, effort between these organizations to further engage. And that is a great benefit to you, our UAS students. If you're interested in volunteering and participating in outreach efforts or various UAS operation volunteer opportunities, again, please email Paul Snyder uh, for uh, advice on how to get involved in those areas. Now I'm going to turn it over to Professor Lewis Archer. Professor Archer is the associate chair who deals with our, assistant chair, excuse me, who deals with our flight courses. And he's gonna provide some updates more specific to those flight courses. Lewis. 
All right. Thank you, Brett. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody. My name is Lewis Archer, uh, Assistant Chair of Flat Academics. A uh, couple updates to share with regards to our upcoming spring registration. Um, first point there, flight course registration will open November 1st at 9 a.m. So that's an important date and time uh, for everyone to mark on their calendar, November 1st at 9 a.m. Uh, and as Dean Krauss mentioned earlier, our, our first step is uh, to reserve or pre-register a seat in AIMS um, and that AIMS system does not um, look at anything else other than flight progress. So um, the student must meet a, a certain lesson count uh, depending on which course they're registering for. Um, the details of that will be made, avail made available on the AIMS registration page. So when a student goes in to register, uh, excuse me, to pre-register in AIMS, um, they will be taken to uh, essentially a landing page and that will list out all of the requirements for each individual course. So that information will be provided um, on that page. Um, and again, as a reminder, every student must be complete uh, with all their prerequisite flight training to enroll in Campus Connection. Campus Connection, again, serves as our official record of registration uh, at the university. Uh, the deadline to finish prerequisite flight training will be the Friday at noon prior to the first week of class. Um, now, it's important to note that, of course, most of our classes start a specific day uh, in January, but we do have some um, classes that start on a, on a different timeline, um, and they will have different deadlines associated with them. So the, the key thing to remember is the Friday at noon, Friday at noon prior to whenever that class begins um, is going to be the deadline to finish the prerequisite flight training. Uh, our flight course enrollment uh, process, as mentioned earlier, um, consists of three steps. The first step is the pre-registration or reservation of the seat in Ames. And again, this allows a student who is making adequate progress in their, in their flight training to uh, basically hold a seat um, and allow them to plan their schedule for uh, the upcoming semester while they're given an opportunity to finish their remaining flight training. Um, any student that does not, uh, again, meet that Friday deadline would be removed from that pre-registration list, which uh, would uh, potentially open up some seats in that class uh, and allow additional students who do meet that uh, requirement to, to claim that seat. Um, so that second step is the uh, registration and campus connection, which again requires completion of all prerequisite flight training. Um, this is not an automated process. This is a manual process uh, involving a few people. So when a student does complete their prerequisite flight training, uh, we are actively tracking and monitoring that, and we will issue the authorization to that individual student for them to register in Campus Connection. And the student will receive an email to the email address that the student entered into Ames. Um, and that email will inform the student that they are now eligible to register for that class in Campus Connection. Again, it's not an automated process, so uh, we do ask for patience um, when a student does finish their prerequisite flight training. But again, if they have a seat that is reserved in Ames, um, that, that seat is theirs. Um, we just have to make sure we complete the process. Uh, and then the third step is the flight lab selection, which also occurs in Ames. Uh, and that will require a student to be registered in Campus Connection, um, usually about 24 to 48 hours after registration in Campus Connection. A student can then log into Ames and they will be able to select their flight lab uh, for that associated course at that time. And that is all the updates that I have for the time being. So I'll pass it over to our Chief Flight Instructor for Airplanes, Jeremy Reisler. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jeremy Reisler, I'm the Chief Flight Instructor for our Airplane Flight Training. I'm gonna go through a few of the hot topics that usually comes up in discussions for the, the flight training. But uh, next slide, please, Beth. Um, flight instructor staffing, uh, when I wrote the slides, we were at 238. I think we're at 236 today. That, that's, uh, um, it's an active process. It's a sign that, that our graduates and former employees um, have great opportunities out there in the industry. Um, we will continue to hire. We have plans to hire again. I'm getting to that here in a little bit. Um, but the students that are in Aviation 325, 414, and 415, those require our most experienced flight instructors. Those are the courses that are most challenged with flight instructor staffing. Those flight instructors will be busy and uh, their availability will not be as like they are for the other courses. So there is a, a change when students hit those courses and it's really based upon we need experienced flight instructors for those uh, uh, courses. So next slide, please, Beth. 
Uh, we will be hiring in December. We, uh, we our normal hiring pattern is to hire December, May, and July. And this coincides with the beginning of a semester. So we do a new employee training, get them on staff in time for the new semester when classes begin. That is our normal hiring rotation and that, that's our plan moving forward. So um, the next round of hiring is uh, December 2021. Um, go ahead, next, next slide, Beth. Uh, with our new TCOs, that's the big change. And I'm just gonna keep it short and sweet. And, and if you have questions, uh, we'll, we'll save that for the Q&A. But our new commercial and instrument training courses, which is 221, 222, 323, 24, is actually going pretty good. Both the um, old course finish up and then transitioning students into the new course, it's going pre pretty good. Um, so the students are aware of, of the changes and, and participating, which is great. Um, the big thing, next slide, please, Beth. Uh, the big thing is the understanding the hours. So again, this uh, it's. I'm not going to get into great detail here, but these are the FAA requirements for a commercial and instrument uh, certificate, 40 hours for an instrument ring or around 40 hours, 120 hours for a commercial certificate, which comes out to be about 160 hours. And that's 220, that's three semesters of flying. Um, so when you look at, uh, next slide, please. Um, when you look at it, we recommend students fly 55 hours a semester in these courses. They can go through these courses and do them in minimum time. They complete all the lessons, they do minimum hours. They can complete it, meet the requirements for registration like Lewis just went through and register for the next course. The problem is, is that if they don't do enough flight training when they get into that 323, 324 semester, they're gonna end up creating a gap semester to get to that 160 hour point. Um, and so that's why it's important for students to utilize the weather and utilize their, their time and their CFI's time uh, wisely uh, moving forward. So um, go ahead, Beth, sorry. Um, the, uh, um, we're busy, we're, we're extremely busy. Um, and so when that happens, every student wants a check ride in November and December. Everybody wants a check ride right before they uh, leave for winter break and uh, there will be wait times. Um, staffing for end of course stage checks, especially the higher level stage checks, is tough to do when we have an industry that is rapidly hiring. There will be wait times. We're anywhere from a records course clear to uh, being on a stage check. So the advice we're giving students is be ready to go. Um, there's a lot of days in November and December where the weather is bad, and state check pilots are just simply calling students that are waiting for check rides and seeing if they're available on short notice. And we understand not everybody is. No one should be skipping class, but there are opportunities out there to do a stage check on, on short notice at times. Um, students making sure they're involved in their records, uh, comparing their records to their logbook, making sure everything is good, and just simply being ready with uh, studying, being prepared, and having those written exams done. Um, next slide, please. The uh, winter break is uh, sometimes gets a spotlight on it where we have a three week long winter break. And some view that as a great time to be doing a lot of flight training. And the reality is at the beginning of winter break, it is at the very end of winter break, it is, but not in the middle. Uh, we got to allow our employees time off for holidays and to be with family. So students should be prepared for very limited flight training activities, December 22nd through January 5th. That's due to a combination of days that were closed for the holidays, low flight instructor staffing, again, just simply to allow them time off. And then we do have employee workshops on January 4th and 5th to get ready for the new semester. So a lot is going on over winter break to prepare and to simply give our, our folks a break. So um, the last day of finals is December, Friday, December 17th. When you look at that, there's a few days there uh, up until the 22nd, that's a great opportunity for more flight training and stage checks. But just please realize uh, during during winter break, the 22nd to the 5th, we are we are limited. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Beth. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. It's hard to believe you're already talking about winter break when it feels like summer outside, but we are halfway through the semester. So again, just finishing up our, our week seven. So Things are going well. My name is Beth Bierke. I serve as the Associate Dean for the College of Aerospace. 
Uh, I also get to help work with our Aerospace Success Center, which is, of course, all of our professional advisors in the College of Aerospace here to help all of you. So we have just some quick updates. Uh, like we've mentioned, spring registration is right around the corner. Uh, flight course registration starts on November 1st, but that's also when early registration starts for students. And again, that is based on uh, the number of credit hours you have, as well as a few other things. Uh, you should be able to see your date and time to register for courses by Friday, October 29th. Usually it's a little bit sooner than that, but it's important to get out there on that date and really write down and put a calendar alert for yourself to know when you can register for all of your academic classes on campus. As we know, and Brett shared with us some of the numbers for this fall, we do have a lot of students. And so of course, courses and sections are going to fill up. It's very important that as soon as you can register for classes, you do that. So know your registration date and time. Also, we encourage you to meet with your academic advisor as you're thinking about how to register and what to register for spring semester. Uh, be aware that over the summer months leading into the new school year, we do do a quite a few advisement shifting uh, from the college. If you had professional advisors your freshman year and you're in good academic standing, uh, we did move you to aviation faculty members for your sophomore year. Uh, you can find out who your academic advisor is by looking on Starfish or Campus Connection. Uh, so make sure you know who that individual is and reach out if you have questions about course selections or you just want to sit down and get advice on your four-year plan or career advice for when you graduate. So don't wait until the night before registration to make that appointment. Be meeting with them now in October uh, ahead of time. Uh, also, if you would like to change your academic advisor, uh, you can always email our ask team at ask at arrow.uand.edu and we can process that request for you as well. Uh, we do, do, it's not a new service, but it's in a new location and a new look to it uh, this fall semester. We have the Aerospace Learning Center, which was previously on the first floor of our first floor in Odegaard Hall, where we put our new aviation safety and data analytics lab. We moved the learning center up to the third floor of Odegaard. We've hired a, a lab manager to really help oversee it. He's doing a great job. I think there's actually a review session going on right now. Uh, for a 102 block exam that they're leading there, but this is staffed by volunteer tutors uh, from the CFI and I class, as well as this year, we're bringing in our atmospheric science teaching associates as well to provide some meteorology uh, tutoring. Uh, over COVID, we learned that we can do effective tutoring online via Zoom. So there's kind of both options. You can go in person when the lab is open, as well as some Zoom only sessions, especially on those Sunday evenings as you prepare for the, uh, the coming week. So if you haven't been up there in the third floor of Border Guard Hall recently, uh, make sure to go check it out and meet with some of the tutors up there. It's also been a very busy start to the school year, uh, finally being able to bring our industry partners back on campus in person for events. So hopefully all of you have taken advantage of some of these uh, events already, and we're always working and scheduling more events uh, in the near future. So of course, we had visits already from Delta Airlines, Endeavor Airlines, United Aviates. We had a FedEx takeover day. Sun Country was just here last week. Uh, we also had the UND Career Fair over at the Alaris Center that brought about 16 aerospace companies to campus. So uh, like Dean Krause mentioned, it's an exciting time to be in aviation. We're also working with other industry partners to in, increase our pathway programs as well as to uh, host them on campus. So coming up, Brett mentioned the UAS Summit next week, that Thursday, October 14th event for our UAS students. We also have a Cirrus Takeover Day coming November 2nd. And this is a campus-wide takeover because, of course, Cirrus Aircraft hires engineers, hires supply chain management, uh, needs to really hire pilots uh, and other aviation professionals. So they'll be on campus speaking in classes, having a barbecue at the airport, and we're really hoping has a great vision jet on static display at the airport as well on uh, November 2nd. That's a Tuesday. Uh, we're also scheduling Horizon Air uh, in mid-November as well. We revamped that pathway program uh, with them. And of course, Horizon Air is owned by Alaska Airlines. How to find out about these visits? Of course, there is the UNE calendar on the website. We keep that up to date as soon as we know information on these visits, so make sure you're following that. We also have our UND Aerospace Weekly Update that comes out every Friday morning, and we try to highlight events taking place, whether it's industry visits, if there's student org meetings that we know about taking place, and other kind of advising announcements. So make sure you check your email, your UND email. That's our official form of communication, but always look for our weekly newsletter on Friday mornings as well, and make sure to check out what is happening. <clears throat> Uh, also, make sure you realize that Scholarship Central for next year uh, is already out there in line. That opens up on October 1st of every year, and then it closes uh, February, March timeframe. But do not forget to apply for both internal UND scholarships, but also external scholarships that exist to help all of you uh, pay for this education. 
And last but not least, you know, Dean Kraus mentioned uh, the Safety Week and our focus on mental health and well-being. A lot of great resources out there. In fact, we've put together a task force of faculty, staff, and students to look at that uh, this issue in our college. We've also been reaching out to our industry partners to learn uh, what they are doing as we're emerging out of COVID and, and getting back engaged and active. Uh, we found out recently UND has a great well-being app uh, that they are uh, pushing out to students and faculty and staff alike. I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, download that app. It has a lot of great tips, a lot of great uh, ways to meditate and really kind of be in the present and take care of your well-being. There's also some great uh, resources out there that are available uh, that the airline industry is putting out. For example, we met with United Airlines uh, Elbow representatives and they have a great podcast series called the Leading Edge Podcast and they have a whole section of it called Piloting Your Mind. And again, this is geared towards the Elpa uh, United pilots, but a lot of it we can take away and use ourselves. Also tomorrow you'll be receiving a survey uh, from myself uh, about a pilot a mental health uh, survey that we're trying to gauge information and get insights from you, our students uh, and our pilots so that we can put together more programming and really focus in uh, on this issue and really help each other during this time. So with that, we are going to turn it over to Q&A. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is the Q&A button on there. We encourage you, if you have any questions, either about what was presented this evening or anything else, please do uh, submit a question in that Q&A. And we've got about 20 minutes here to, uh, to answer those. So Brett, do you have the first question? I do. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate that. And Jeremy, you are, uh, as usual, popular. So this first question will go to you. If there is a shortage of flight instructors for AVIT 325, 414, and 415, will this impact the ability of kids to be able to finish each class in one semester? It seems like there will be a lot of kids waiting around for flight time, which could result in kids not being able to move forward to the next class. This would mean they would miss a semester of flying. Yeah, great question. It's not a matter of will this, it, it is, and it will continue to be. Uh, this is our courses that are affected the most for flight training. Um, the experience level that is required for those courses is right at the point where our instructors are moving on to the airlines. I recently spoke in one of our flight instructor courses and I just flat out asked him if we paid flight instructors $50 an hour, would you stay here or would you go to the airlines? And they 100% said, no, nah, I'm, I'm out of here going to the airlines. Um, so we're not going to penalize today's students by trying to raise pay to maybe uh, hold on to these flight instructors longer, but it is directly related to the industry status. We didn't have this issue during COVID because no one was hiring, but now that the airlines are hiring, uh, this, this shortage has, has uh, resumed. So we do our best in making sure that all students have a fair opportunity to flight training in those courses, but uh, it continues to be a challenge. Thanks, Jeremy. Our next question is actually for our Director of Aviation Safety, Mr. Brian Willis, who is out of town this week at an Aviation Safety Conference, fittingly. So I did uh, get the answer for him, from him, though. So I, the question asks, I'm not flying this semester. Do I need to complete the Safety Week videos? They are not in my Blackboard. So first of all, if you are finishing up your flight training uh, this semester from a previous semester, you absolutely need to do the Safety Week videos. They're actually in the flight training lab site. So you should have access to that site in your Blackboard uh, and make sure that you watch those videos. If you're in, if you're a new student to UND and you haven't started your flight training and you're in my Aviation 100 class, I did actually send Mr. Willis uh, all of your names and emails so that he could put you into the system because we do want you to start getting yourself immersed in that safety culture. And these are great videos with great information. You do not need to be flying yet to uh, actually learn a lot and gain information from those. So you should be added shortly uh, if you haven't been already. I just sent him the list last Friday. So uh, hopefully he's figured out how to add all of you into that site. Thanks, Beth. The next question is uh, for Lewis. It's an Ames registra registration question. Ames won't allow me to choose spring semester or 102. It only gives the option for fall 2021 and course 480. Absolutely. So um, as mentioned earlier, November 1st at 9 a.m. is going to be the date and time at which uh, spring registration becomes available. Um, so what you see in the Ames registration system at the moment is our um, uh, remaining fall semester courses. So we do have a session of AVIT 480 um, that begins in November. So that, that, of course, is still open for registration right now for the fall semester. But uh, the spring semester courses will populate in that system 
on November 1st at 9 a.m. Thanks, Louis. Jeremy, another question for you. What is the UND policy for social media? Kids taking selfies, taping their flights, et cetera, then posting them on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, great question. And uh, I, I'm all for students documenting their flight training as far as, you know, proud moments like check rides and first solos and that kind of stuff. Though that We want them doing that kind of stuff safely, properly, ethically. Um, so we do have a set of policies that address this. And uh, it's in our safety policy procedures. I'm not going to read it, but but it, it uh, the students all have have access to it. But as long as they are complying with those policies, they they have the green light to be doing that. Are they going to be taking pictures, selfies, solo? No, uh, absolutely not. Uh, we do have a process in play for a risk assessment for them to uh, mount a camera to the inside of of the airplane, uh, but they have to go through a strict uh, safety risk assessment for that. Yeah, ultimately, what we don't want to have happen is the student have their attention distracted where they're focusing on the camera and not the airplane. Um, no different than texting and driving. No different. Let me add on to that. So there are some social media posts out there on TikTok and a few other things that it turns out are actually ambassadors of our program. And so we've been working with our ambassadors to make official they're actually doing that in an official capacity. And it has gone through this review process for them to do that and it is being done in a very safe manner. Now, if we do hear about students that are doing it not in compliance, then we'll, we'll deal with those students individually. Thank you, Jeremy and Dean Krause. The next question we'll give to uh, Lewis, I think. Lewis, what's the likelihood of a mid-semester 221 in the spring? Um, so that's very much dependent on, uh, number one, the demand, and number two, the resources that we have available to support that. Um, it, at this point, it would be far too early to tell. Um, once once spring registration opens and, and those classes start to fill, if, if we see that there's a need, then we will explore the options that we have. But again, it's it really comes down to a matter of what resources do we have available. And if we don't have the resources to support that, then, then we can't we can't support that. Thanks, Lewis. Brett, here's a question for you. How will UND determine which incoming freshman students will be chosen for the slots for fall of 2022? I'm reading the question myself here, too. How will UND determine which incoming freshman students will be chosen for the 320? Oh, the 320. Okay. Yeah, I was sorry. misinterpreting. I was thinking AVIT 325. I'm trying to put together how a freshman student is flying in AVIT 325. Um, well, those students will uh, have to have a 3.0 GPA, and as long as they have a 3.0 GPA, it will be first come, first serve based on date of deposit. Um, so we will look back at the date of deposit and then enroll the students um, or allow the students to register from there. We will have a different process based on GPA for enrollment in 102, depending upon whether it's a fall, spring, or a summer 102 section. Okay, uh, Jeremy, here is a question for you. What are the CFI requirements and how do we work towards that in 102? I think they're they're looking ahead for when they might get hired as a CFI. Sure, we, yeah, so what are the requirements to teach someone else to be a flight instructor? Well, there's two pathways. You could either be a licensed flight instructor for two years and uh, have 200 hours of experience. And that two year window is longer than how our how long our, our CFIs are usually employed. They, they average 12 to 14 months. Um, or the second pathway is that they have 400 hours of experience, dual given, and a 80% pass rate uh, for their students. Um, but again, that 400 hours is on top of their own flight training. So those instructors are in the neighborhood of six to 700 hours by the time they meet that requirement. And then they're only about 300 hours away from going to the airlines. So it's a, it's a pretty rapid, turnover in, in those courses. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, the question that I, I will take a stab at answering, the question asks, is there a website to view the weekly UND Aerospace updates? First of all, that is a wonderful idea, and I'm going to talk tomorrow morning with our uh, social media guru on how we might be able to catalog and archive those on our website. Uh, if you do want to subscribe, please either send myself an email or ask at aero.uned.edu, and I know we can add you to the weekly update. 
Uh, I know in the past too, we've advertised this out to our, our parent group as well that they can subscribe themselves. But again, it's a great update on what's going on. So we will look into how to put it online on the website, but definitely can email myself or ask at arrow.und.edu. And I know we can put you in that way as well. Thanks, Beth. I think this question would probably be best for Jeremy. Jeremy, how can I get access to Ames if I am currently not in a flight course and I am a freshman? Great question. So if you go to the web address ames.arrow.und.edu, you'll have all the directions right there for uh, creating an account and uh, either accessing it through a browser or downloading it to your uh, PC. Um, so aims.arrow.und.edu and you got all your information. Thanks, Jeremy. Lewis, here's a question for you. So if someone registers for their flight lab on November 1st and is done with all of their flight training, can they theoretically register for their flight lab the next day? Or how does that work? Yeah, so if, if somebody pre-registers and aims on November 1st and they are finished with the prerequisite course at that time, uh, they would be issued authorization to register for that class in Campus Connection shortly after. Again, it's not an automated process, so it might take um, perhaps up to a week for that authorization to go through. Once that student then registers in Campus Connection, yes, they should theoretically be able to uh, uh, select that flight lab at Ames within 24 to 48 hours after Campus Connection registration. So bottom line, they must be done with the previous semester flying to get into Campus Connection and to get that flight lab, correct? That's, that's correct, yep. Lewis, we'll stick with you for this one. Will we know on November 1st if we have made enough flight progress in our current course to reserve a spot for the next course for spring? Yes, you should know as long as you're tracking your own progress. That's number one. So um, those uh, the, the required lesson count, again, will be listed on that uh, AIMS landing page. Once you click on, on the registration uh, function in AIMS, it'll take you to the landing page and it will list out what how many lessons you need to have completed in that previous course. And assuming you match that number or higher than you would be able to pre-register at that time. So the question is, how do we apply for aid? I'm assuming it's financial aid to help with flight costs. Uh, of course, University of North Dakota does have a financial aid office, and we are fortunate to have our own aviational, aviation financial aid representative here in the Odegaard School. Her name is Elaine Erickson. She meets with students all the time. Uh, for those of you that are in Aviation 100, I have her slated to come into our class and talk about this process to all of our new students here in the coming weeks. Um, she is a great resource for you, and that is for federal financial aid. And again, just want to put a plug in there again for both internal and external scholarships. Make sure you're applying for those. Uh, it's very difficult to get scholarships after you graduate. So you want to apply uh, and try to obtain as many as you can while you are a student. But Elaine Erickson, her office is with our ASK team uh, in Odegaard Hall, room 200. Okay, and this is the last question that we have in the Q&A. So if you have a burning question that you haven't typed in yet, please feel free to do that so we can take a stab at it for you. I'll give this one to Lewis. Uh, Lewis, how will the upgraded requirements for AVIT 102 affect incoming transfer students in 2022? So an incoming transfer, uh, assuming that incoming transfer is admitted for the fall, uh, fall of 2022, um, essentially the, the requirements for a transfer student would not have been impacted. So a transfer student must have at least a 2.6 um, college GPA uh, or greater, and, and they would considered they would be considered to be eligible um, for that course. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing other, any other questions in the Q and A, so we uh, look like we've exhausted our questions. Yep, I would agree. Uh, Dean Krause, do you have any closing statements you would like to make? I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And then uh, if there are people that are watching this as a recording and we did not answer your question, uh, please, probably the best email to send it to is, is to our advisors. And, and Beth, that was, it was ASC. Yep. At Ask at arrow. I'll type it in the chat here. I'm trying to multitask. UND.edu. And that goes to our professional okay. advising team. And one of them will get back to you. So even if it's a flight related, I mean, obviously all the registration questions are, are, are good for them, but the specific flight ones, they, they can at least get it to the one of the rest of us that would be able to answer it. Great. 
Well, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thanks to everybody on the panel for your, uh, your help with our Aviation Town Hall. Have a great night. All right. Good night, everyone.